and good morning everyone so if there was a session that was required to give the perfect start to your day well this one has to be it because we are in the august company of three erudite speakers who also happen to be best selling authors and today we are going to speak to them on topics of cult cunning and conspiracies so uh, i'd like to start off this session by you know talking about the fact that you know it said that everybody loves a good conspiracy and uh, you know conspiracy theorists as uh, you know they have been called uh, there has been a gradual rise and steady rise of you know conspiracy theorists not only in india but across the world and these theories have actually given way to very intense you know dinner room debates and discussions with people on both sides of the fence so what i wanted to ask each one of you was that what do you make out of these theories and how important a role do these theories play when you are conceptualizing a topic for your book so shatrujit maybe you'd like to start off yeah uh, thanks uh, sohel i think uh, your conspiracy theories are yeah everyone likes a good story i think i think that's the whole point true, true. and everyone also likes a story that has not been told <laughs> we all like to believe that you know that you know there's a, this there's something that no one else knows and i have figured it out there is a deeper truth or a deeper reality and i think that's what excites us about conspiracy theories uh, uh the reason why it's 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 such a such a fantastic space is because and and the beauty about conspiracy theories is that uh the good conspiracy theories theories sound very believable they sound like ha huh, this could have could happened have, this absolutely. and you know the, the more outlandish ones are actually absurd you immediately call it call the bluff you know that okay this is not this can't be true but the really good ones do so i think i think it's just that our our, our desire to tell stories uh it's 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 innate human nature to tell stories and uh when you find those kind of stories which uh, obviously uh, kind of you know either subvert the system or you know look at uh, simply look at the reality from a new lens uh, it becomes exciting for everyone because it's it's a new way of looking at at life so sure. i think that's that's why we love conspiracy theories so that's just my take on that perfect perfect so uh, kulpreet bhai if you'd like to add to it and then we'll go to to him yeah, as well yeah uh, <coughs> thank you as uh, my friend shatrujit has said uh conspiracy theories uh, so it's very difficult to figure out what is truth now correct particularly uh, in today's time where fake media fake news fake information all that appears so true through social media through newspapers so many channels information coming from so many places so this is the sad reality but as storytellers i think it's a fascinating space because you can pick things from one place and the other and um, weave it all well and give it the form of a story which becomes uh, kind of a satisfying read which is what we have been doing particularly me because i write espionage yeah. and uh, international espionage is a very intriguing space we really don't know none of us knows though i've had little bit of experience in the defense uh, no i've had fair bit of experience in defense but little bit in intelligence but we don't know what really happens so even your boss may not be speaking the truth your subordinate might be saying something to you so it's a it's you you are as if caught in a uh, what do you call that uh, uh, room mirror and smoke there's something like that <laughs> yeah. smokes and mirrors smokes, smokes and, mirrors. and mirrors something like that so i've been trying to uh, stay in this space and i i find this space myself very fascinating and uh, yeah these are the initial thoughts wonderful duin bhai if you'd like to add to it thank you thank you suhail uh, good to be back at pilf <laughs> so without a conspiracy there is no story right so conspiracy is an inherent part of uh, every story recently i have worked on uh, you know this subaltern history narrative the first of that series was yes. the great uh, sorry the, the legend of birsa munda of sankita varma the second was the great tribal of warriors of bharat i think the very fact that these uh, heroes were excluded from our books of history for a very long period of time I think is a was a conspiracy of gigantic proportions so I think my effort in the last 2 years has been to do away or to kind of a, absolutely uh, get to the bottom of that conspiracy and bring the truth about these fighters to the fore so yes I mean conspiracy is a part of every story and more so of um, you know the stories of some intriguing characters who have been misinterpreted in history and sure. uh, who have been misunderstood in history no i think that's a very valid point and we'll also come back to it because what you've done via your uh, you know recent books is very important and in integral Thank you. you know as far as uh, india's history is concerned but let me take all of you back uh, you know 
to memory lane and you know the whole fascination with conspiracy theories of course starts when you read about it or you learn about it so um i would like to ask each one of you that which was probably the first conspiracy theory or the conspiracy theory that you read which really blew your mind for example you know i was recently reading about a conspiracy theory um which spoke about how uh, you know homi baba this plane crash was actually not uh, organic but it was manifested by the cia and what that also says the report also says is that there have been a lot of deaths of isro scientists in strange ways and uh, the manner in which it's been done is very professional so so you know it was it was interesting to know that something like that's there and as you mentioned that these are kind of stories that really don't come to the forefront so what i wanted to ask all three of you was that which was the first or probably which is the most interesting conspiracy that you know told you that okay this is something this is a space that i would definitely like to write in so maybe we can take it well, like this if you ask me about the first conspiracy story it would be a hardy boy <laughs> series <laughs> nice book nice. that's nice uh, and i think uh, at the age of 9 or 10 i must have read about 40 50 uh, books of hardy boys but so there are so many of them really when you when you talk about such stories in recent years um in fact the disappearance of uh, netaji subhash chandra bose has been yeah. one of the biggest uh, conspiracies or one of the biggest mysteries in recent times you know there is a mystery around uh, the way the entire kashmir problem so i think uh, and then obviously there are the usual crime stories where uh, where uh, if you look at the aftab shraddha case i think one can't ah. come across a more murkier case so i think i mean conspiracy stories and uh, the darker stories gallo all the time <coughs> there's no dearth of it and uh, with uh, the advent of social media they only you know you only see them or they're more visible to the world than they were ever, ever before <laughs> true very interesting could be like yeah so uh, kashmir of course is one netaji subhash chandra bose is the other one and uh, lal bahadur shastri uh, suddenly uh, dying at a you know a remote corner of the world uh during tashkan just after signing tashkan agreement is another one and there are so many others uh, this kashmir no it was called kashmir princess or what was indian princess the plane that flew from hong kong it was supposed to take the chinese premier just uh, just before the 1962 war it was going to jakarta and it okay. it sank i think it was called the kashmir princess if i'm not wrong and uh, just in the last minute the chinese intelligence had made sure that uh, the premier uh, the chinese premier does not board that aircraft and uh, in fact india and china were at loggerheads for a long period of time and we investigated and we found out that it was actually the the erstwhile chinese government which was settled in taiwan etc so a lot of conspiracy but let me tell you the newest conspiracy yesterday last night so after i spent the day here i went to my room and i started looking for my phone charger <laughs> and i couldn't find it in my suitcase my bag and i i thought probably i left it home though i never do that i'm quite organized it at a personal level i must say but i called up my wife at 11 o'clock in the night uh, unsure whether she'll be sleeping or she'll be awake and i said charger ghar mein rakha hua hai kya so she went to all the rooms uh, very uncomfortable and she said nahi ghar pe to nahi hai so then i started thinking kahan pe gaya then where is it i started really you know what will i do without a charger because my phone will get discharged and where will i find in the morning i have to do this 10 o'clock session what if someone tries to get in touch with me i got uh, a little stressed about this and then i sa- i couldn't i couldn't find it and uh, i thought that maybe when i was boarding the flight from delhi uh, my saman had gone and norm- normally you know you go in such a way that your saman goes and you go you arrive at the same time but my shoe beeped so you know i was sent back and then again to stand in the line and by the time i came my my stuff was lying in one corner for a while and somebody must have picked up my iphone charger from there i started thinking mm. all these thoughts and I'm deep in sleep also what am i going to do with the charger and this morning when i was thinking whether to wear this shoe or the other shoe i opened the shoe section where i don't keep my charger i found my charger there <laughs> so my phone is 90% charged everything is all right so so sometimes we we have a little information or even if you have more information we so it's it's very difficult to find truth um yeah no i can just so I, many versions of it also true true no i mean i completely 
relate to what you were saying because yesterday for my yesterday session I was looking for my spectacles and I thought I lost them at the hotel's lobby. Only at night I came and I saw they were lying beneath the towel. So, <laughs> so, so that's, you know, that's one thing that will never happen to me because without my spectacles I can't see anything. So that's <laughs> that's never going to happen. To me. So when you can't believe yourself, then definitely don't believe others. Just read a story for entertainment. No, very very interesting. Also the Kashmir point very interesting. I was going to bring it up, but I started feeling a little iffy about it. <laughs> but. Uh, Shatruji, please, please carry on and mention something. So it's actually d difficult to see, you know, what was that first big conspiracy theory that kind of struck me or whatever it is. Yeah, and there are just so many of them. Uh, like, for example, yes, Netaji is one, one classic example of that. Ta Tashkent, yeah. uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri's thing is, is, is huge. But one of the ones that really caught me first, and I, I just love that, was the, was the entire manipulation out around big tobacco uh, in the U.S., the way the tobacco companies, they kind of, you know, and, the, and the, there was this entire conspiracy theory about, or, or even for example, 9-11. I think it's a fascinating conspiracy yeah, theory about what actually happened at 9-11 uh, with, with, uh, with the bombing of, of uh, you know, and, and there is, the, so again, as I said, you could, you look at it one way, you say, no, no, it, it has to have happened the way it did. And then you, you change the perspective a little and you say, but no, but then why did it happen this way? And there's something suspicious about it, right? So that's that. Usually, what happens? Uh, I think Arushi Talwar case is is a is a classic, classic example of so much of muddling that has happened in terms of nobody really now knows what actually happened. There are just so many versions of the truth, which is what, as I said. So I think these are these are what you know. Uh, and and you also realize, and I think a good conspiracy theory works when you've got when you understand that there is a vested interest that is trying to hide the truth, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to just bumbling. There are two sides to it. One, one is one is when you bumble and you make a mistake, and you know, that's just pure pure incompetence. And incompetence doesn't make a conspiracy theory. Uh, intentional uh, hiding of facts, making things murky. Uh, I think that's what lends uh, wings to conspiracy th conspiracy theories because you realize that there is a system that is trying to suppress the truth. That's when conspiracy theories really work, and right. and all all good conspiracy theories uh, uh, conspiracy theories work on that principle. Wonderful, that's well said. So, um, you know, whenever we look at the broad genre of conspiracy fiction per se, you'll always find that they'll have a lot of twists, turns, race against time. What I've also noticed in particular with respect to the books that all three of you have written, that the conspiracies do not stay limited to, say, one particular country. You know, it traverses geographical boundaries. Now, what I wanted to understand is that, um, is it a deliberate attempt? Or do you feel that adding layers, because you know there will be different players and interests at play, as you were recently mentioning, uh, would you know add more layers to the storytelling? So, if all three of you could share your thoughts, maybe Kulpreet Bhai, why don't you start off first? And maybe, maybe if all of you could give an example of something that how you brought in a particular nation and their interests, because I think it'll help uh, you know the reader, uh, the audience understand that. Um, let me say it like this, that uh, as a storyteller, you're always looking for a very interesting opening that will pull in the readers. And thereafter, you would like to tell a story. I'm talking about the fiction space right now. Yeah, yeah. You'd like to tell a story which is very, uh, very interesting and very different at the same time. When I was writing my book, Murder in Pahar Ganj, I, I started thinking that, okay, in India, a lot of murder mysteries have already been written. India, Pakistan you know, the intelligence war between RAW and ISI, all that has been going on for a while, Bangladesh separation, everything has been written. But what if the rivalry of Iran and Israel that the whole world knows how ugly it is, that rivalry, if I bring that rivalry to Delhi and create an Indian character, an Indian innocent character who's caught between the battle bit of these two intelligence agencies. I think that will be very different. Now, it sounds very difficult. Yeah. Uh, but when I started thinking more about it, I realized that this can be done. So, the conspiracy, uh, you know, uh, after that, as you said, twist and turns. So, I could imagine and create the conspiracies around this theme. And uh, whenever a, a writer, all of us know, when you start writing, you're not very sure whether the exciting idea that you have right now is exciting enough to last through the book. Sometimes halfway through, you know, sure. you yourself start feeling, "Arey, yar, to meti mai itna bore ho gaya, isko aur koi padega, to ab isko band kar do." But kai bar kya hota hai ki, you know, that idea keeps on going, 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 and it goes up to the end. So that happened uh, with with this book. Um, I would like to also address about the non-fiction space. I think as writers, we also have responsibility not just to entertain people, but also to do something in our lives which brings clarity. Yeah. Uh, to to the people's imagination, and I, 
I'm writing currently a book on uh, on the Haji Pir battle, which happened in 1965. Uh, Sohel is representing it, so he knows it very well. So very interesting battle. It is also connected with Tashkent because Tashkent happened later. We captured Haji Pir, we gave it back to them. But there's lot of information about this battle, and it took me almost two years to figure out what actually is the truth. And I think now I know what is the truth. And the reason that I know what is the truth, and we we need not have conspiracy around this. We won't have, I'm sure. It's going to be authoritative. It's going to be definitive for sure. Is because many people have left written accounts. Right. I think uh, you know when I'm I'm also from from the from the marine background. So in a ship, when a ship goes aground or there is a fire or there's flooding, there is any accident, you always go for the logbook in the wheelhouse on the bridge where every single instance is written where you, when everything is all right. That is the only document with which you can find out the truth. So I think we, when we write in non-fiction space, and, and really hats off to Tohin for, as he rightly said, some of the stories which were marginalized for vested interests or for whatever uh, reasons, but that was not a good thing to do. And uh, it is our responsibility to bring out these stories and these truths so that the conspiracies per se can be laid to rest. Very interesting, very interesting. Tohin Bhai, you've done the first thriller set in you know the pandemic and the book did really well so I mean it would be wonderful if you could mention that story I think the mic is every story chooses its characters no it's fine every story chooses its characters and every character chooses his or her premise so that I think as a writer there is very little one can do to contain that um, so Talking about Mission Shenzhen, which yeah. was co-authored with uh, Clark, Prasad, Clark Prasad, who calls yeah. himself a conspiracy theorist. Okay. You know, so he, he, in fact, it would have been great to have him in the session because his Twitter prof profile, in his Twitter pro profile, he describes himself as a conspiracy theorist. Right. So that book essentially was, uh, it had a simple question for the readers. Exactly. Is there more to the pandemic? Yeah. Is it a bio-warfare? But more important than that, is it an amalgamation of communist and certain you know fundamentalist interests spread right across the world to take on two of the largest democracies in the world which is india and us yeah so in fact uh, there were the characters of uh, mr trump donald trump mr modi uh, you know i mean you could really figure out they sure. were inspired so it was more of a of a, you know i think it would have been unfair for me to restrict that uh, book and that book actually spread i mean the the story spreads across at least six con uh, six different countries, countries spread across four continents um and for so i think you know like i mentioned at the very start uh, more than me deciding the premise i think the once the story is clear in your head yeah. i think uh, the writer just needs to go with the flow and not restrict himself Absolutely. That's the, that's the challenge. No, I, think, I think that's well said because a book of that magnitude requires that scale as well. So it's it's only fair that, you know, those many players come into play. Uh, your book has the name of another uh, a city which is in another country, the Karachi Deception. Please, please tell us a little more about it. So, so actually, that's the only conspiracy theory book which I've written because yeah, after that, yeah. then I moved on to writing mythological fantasies. Yeah. Which is a dis that. different conspiracy yeah. anyway, yeah. but yeah. That's, yeah. that's a different story anyway. But... Um, uh, so Karachi deception was just, it, it all started with a one-line idea, which, you know, all, all stories basically start with a one-line idea. So this is something that, you know, I was sitting with a friend of mine and we were just kind of talking about Dawood Ibrahim. And, uh, you know, something just struck me, and this was, I think, in 2002. And I really, you know, it was just a, you know, what if? Hmm. What if there is a reality about Dawood Ibrahim that we don't know? So it was just an idea, and I did nothing about it, because why you were Then in 2000. Nine run when I sat down and I decided that I wanted to tell a story, and uh, again, as every I've told this often that I, I never wanted to write it as a book. I wanted to write it as a film script right. and take it to Amir Khan and say, you know, please act in it. That's what I really wanted to do. Sure. But I had never written a film script in my world in my life, so at that time I wrote it like a novel. And of course, I never took to me took it to Amir Khan. I, gave, I took it to a publisher and he published it. So, but that was the whole point. It was about. It's just about you know. What is the what is the real truth about Dawood Ibrahim? You know, is mm. that is there something that we have not been told? Uh, and then I kind of took, took that idea and then built on you know if my theory was right, how would that story play out? 
Right. Initially, when we started it, there was no story, and then then you have to sit and kind of justify it. How does how does it play, and how do you kind of unearth this so-called conspiracy? In my case, it was just that it's it's a so-called conspiracy, but then again, it need not be a so-called, and that's why it 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 works. It works because when people I've had people tell me that you know I, 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 this reads like a classified document. Did yeah. do, whom did you research? Whom did you ask? I said I didn't ask anyone. I did it But I so it's it's complete make believe. But I think, that, as I said, because it sounds believable, it works. That's true. So no, in fact, it's very interesting that you mentioned that you know because uh, obviously your book had come out and did well. When I saw this movie called D Day, it it seemed like heavily <laughs> inspired by your no, story. No, I must I must clarify this, and I have a lot of people. You know, they ask me about D Day whether you know D Day was inspired or flicked by from my book. Uh, I must I must tell me tell them that my book came out in Feb 2013. D Day came out I think in June 2013. so there was no way they could have actually flicked my book and made it into a i mean in 5 months you can't do that can't do a that. movie of that scale right. so i don't think they flicked it it's, i think these ideas were floating around and it's just different that they did a different treatment on dawa than i have done a completely different but yeah it's the same space right interesting no great minds think alike i guess <laughs> so so that's that's great so you know generally what it is said is that for any conspiracy to come about its genesis lies in truth which is why there are different sides to it and uh, now there are there are two schools of thought which talk about conspiracies and how you should write them because it requires you know a lot of work when we're talking specifically about uh conspiracies in the fiction space how important is the research because as i said there are two schools of thought one school of thought will propagate the view that you know if you are writing something even if it is fiction and its genesis in truth you should know the ranks terminologies political landscape the problems besieging a particular country you know so so that's why the other school of thought says that well because it is fiction right even if you have a bare idea or or you can you know scratch the surface so to say you can then use that as a starting point and give vent to your creative imagination and write a very interesting book which is at the end of the day what you desire to do so which school of thought do you all subscribe to uh, any one of you would like to take that up you Very know nice. i think we need to go with a responsible mix so i faced this dilemma before writing uh, before embarking upon the journey of birsa munda right now the challenge with subaltern history is that uh, there are no there are very limited primary sources of information because history right. has always been written from the point of view of kings and rulers absolutely and also during their lifetimes most of these subaltern warriors in fact led very short lives they were killed because of uh, you know obviously they were not didn't enjoy Absolutely. government protection yeah. or yeah. so obviously they were killed by the time they were 25 or 30 and most of them became popular 20 or started becoming popular 20 or 30 years post their death post. so this was a challenge right. do i entirely go a you know by first hand research and make it a conventional non fiction book or do i remain true to the character but you know take adequate liberties with the secondary characters which are right. you know the the right. firang villains and because at the end of the day the messaging about the character is more important to to flavor the story interestingly for the Absolutely. younger audience i think you can take liberties with the second Absolutely. secondary character Completely. so i think this was a challenge which i faced with uh, birsa munda a responsible mix is what i think uh, uh, fiction writers should aspire for right and if you achieve that nothing like it i think that's that's great because as as i think kulpreet bhai also mentioned that you don't only seek to entertain but also educate so edutainment is what you're bringing to the table so very very well said kulpreet bhai yeah uh, what tohen is saying is absolutely correct but that is for the uh, non fiction space i think what uh, sohel was asking was for the fiction space and so uh, is, is eventually a fiction book yeah, so eventually it's, it's a narrative fiction. narrative non fiction okay. yeah. is what we probably um it's it's a very interesting topic i don't know how much how many people in the audience would be really keen to know this deeply but i can you know uh, at the surface say that uh, has anyone read the book in cold blood by truman capote capote yeah yeah few of us so that was the first time when uh, creative non fiction was discovered with someone by that name that writer ended up going to a remote place in america where a family was killed by two people and they were missing and he captured that story in the form of a journalistic piece but a long journalistic piece which actually became a novel called the cold blood i've read that book if you want you can read that book so 
that is a non fiction novel and that was the time non fiction novel was discovered now the the good thing about this is that particular incident now became more interesting than probably a non fiction book could have done to that incident and it was about gun laws it is about it was about people living in remote areas with less policing etc all those points came to the fore and they were addressed because it became a successful book not because it was a non fiction book but it, it was a fic- non fiction novel which everybody loved right um so that is what probably something like that toin has done i was also facing the same challenge when i was writing my latest book the battle of rizangla the battle of rizangla happened in 1962 where 120 indian jawans stopped 5000 chinese from taking over a key airfield in ladakh called chushu airfield that was our only link with india otherwise there were no roads at that time so chushu airfield gone means the entire ladakh region could have gone these 120 jawans they fought for several hours and 110 of them were uh, martyred in that battle now the information about this 1962 battle is not that much available in public domain there are some out of print books so i could only go up to a certain extent in finding the facts but at the same time i was mindful of the fact that nobody has written a book about the sacrifice of these people and nobody definitely would write a book in the future so i must write an authoritative authoritative non fiction book how do i do that with an information which might be 40 or 50 pages yeah. so i employed a very simple strategy which i think some of you who want to you know further explore this form of writing you sure. can uh, what i did was without doctoring any of the things that i found or any of the interviews that i you know of, of survivors that i did and one person old person 90 year old who fought the battle is making a statement i'm corroborating that with another person or another written account two people saying i'm finding that truth but still that is about 40 50 pages i thought in writing the greatest when you when you write lengthy description it gets very boring you know so dialogues are always good so now i'm describing a non fiction novel that the jawans are standing and there is a hill in front the hill is called so and so instead of writing like this it's a factual account i'm making two jawans speak to each other mm-hmm. so one guy is saying can you see, can you see the hill in front he says yeah that looks very big it is bigger than the one which we crossed in the jeep earlier yeah this hill is called so and so so the moment you make facts into dialogue without yeah. doctoring them it becomes that much more reader friendly and it gives a little more space but still we were about 140 um, pages 130 pages then after each chapter we added some additional information to make it informative anyway i'll not take more time but just to say that um there are ways in which you can make a uh, non fiction interesting and that is uh, that is what we did no very very well said in fact it's very interesting that you mention about you know these dialogues because one dialogue that really stayed with me was you know uh, i'd gone to see loc cargill and over there we have the you know grenadiers sitting and one of them uh, you know yogendra singh yadav whose character is played by ashutosh rana there were two in the battalion one by manoj bajpai and one ashutosh rana so he asks the commanding officer that aap humko kyun wahan bhej rahe kyunki ek kankar bhi agar girega upar se so 600 mil ki raftar se girega wo now that is a very hardcore factual point but because it has been said in a dialogue format you know it stuck with me so I completely agree with what you're saying. In fact, you know, one of the best things that I found while we were working on the Battle of Rizangla was that. So, see, it, it's it's a battle that happened post independence, but it's been 60 plus years. So there'll be only very few surviving soldiers, and you know, when you get first-hand account, it it really makes a difference. How he actually connected with those people, you know, there were a couple of people who were 93, 94, and you know, they gave uh, information was something that really. uh you know stood out as far as uh, rizangla was concerned so shatrujit my question to you would be that now that we have been discussing that because these books are largely set in the present time period you know researching about it and having a semblance of facts uh, always always helps given that is the case and as you mentioned that you know you've ventured into fantasy as well when you're writing something where you're mixing fantasy with history or or you're writing about a book which is set you know eons ago does that make the job simpler creatively or does that come with its own set of challenges because i think one of the greatest conspiracies conspiracy theories have also been about the nine unknown men and here you've used the council of nine with vikramaditya so what are the set of challenges that you face when you're writing something in the 
fantasy zone and coupling it with mythology. So, uh, uh, before then, uh, just very quickly, so one of the interesting things is what uh, Tuhin does and what, uh, what uh, Kulpreet have done is that they've actually taken historical events or yeah. historical people and tried to kind of demystify it. Yeah. Okay. I have done the opposite of it. I have taken a historical character and mystified him even more actually with <laughs> Karachi deception because I have given him a new angle to, uh, totally which is, does not exist in popular imagination. So there I have actually been, you could turn around and say being, I have been irresponsible. What I am doing is that I am actually saying that what if that is the reality and not this. So I think that's where we are different. So when they have demystified, I have actually mystified the guy even more. Uh, but that's for, for Karachi. Uh, and see, so for Karachi deception, it was again, as I said, it was more, uh, it was a more a story in my head, and uh, there is there is no documented evidence of that, sure. or maybe there is, and I don't have access to that. Uh, but the fact is that uh, so that was essentially a figment of my imagination. When it comes to uh, fantasy characters, yeah, and and, yeah. and and I use the term historical cultural characters, sure. which are drawn from our mythology. Uh, so. I think I think the better example, rather than Vikramaditya, is actually taking Bharat, for example, sure. in the Warlord of Ayodhya. Yeah. So one of the interesting things is that why I decided to do Bharat's story is because the Ramayana has always it's about the four brothers, but the story is always about Ram and Lakshman, and Correct. it's never about the other two brothers. And I found it fascinating that the Ramayana actually happens because of Bharat. I mean, he's the reason the story actually even, even in the Ramayana. Shatru was on the side of Bharat. I was on the side of Bharat, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and I, I, I also have a character called Shatrughan and a, guy, a character called uh, Yuddha Jeep. So, I kind of <laughs> do that and Shatru Jeep. So, that's a different conspiracy theory all there. Okay. So, that's… But the point is with Bharat, when I, when, I, when I set out to do that story, I realized that there was actually nothing on Bharat. So, there is no reference anywhere on what Bharat did. There is in, then, you know, once Uttarakhand happens, then a lot of these questions get answered. So, there is references to what Bharat and Shatrugan did, but that's usually found in Uttarakhand. That's not right. found in the main Ramayana, okay, which is the Valmiki Ramayana. Yeah. So, uh, what happened was when I started exploring it, and this was, this was two, thi two things happened. One is, it's also liberating because you are not bound by anything. But at the same time, you are also have to be responsible to the character and the mythology or the cultural context of that story, which is the Ramayana. You have to be you have to be mindful of what that is. So I think that was where the, again it was a tightrope. What is what is what of Bharat do I represent? What are the truths that uh, Bharat would have had to face? Right. Uh, so I think it was a little bit of that, uh, trying to actually make sure that you know, as as uh, Kulpreet said, you know, you do justice to that character. You don't, you don't end up doing a version of Bharat which is, you know, a reader reads it and says, no, I don't think this could ever have been Bharat's story. Yeah. You yeah. know, there could be people who will disagree. So, if you, if you put out a story and say 30 people disagree, 70 people agree, that's okay. That's fine. If 99% yeah. people disagree and say that this, this could never have happened, mm. then I think you're, you're, you've probably been, you know, knocking at the wrong door. Absolutely. So, I think that's important and that's where the, the so it's two things. One is, one is research and mm. one is how sensitive you are to the subject material. Yeah. As Kulpreet said, yeah. uh, you have to be respectful of what happened in that battle uh, or as, as Tohin said, you know, what that, what Birsa Munda went through. Uh, we might not have access to that information, but if we were in Bursa, Birsa Munda's place, if we were one of his warriors, what would we be going through? Absolutely. What is the reality of what we would have felt? How, how margin, marginalized we would have felt? Uh, if it was those those 120 soldiers, what would they have? I think we just have to put ourselves in those characters' shoes. Yeah. Then we start living those lives and we, and we start telling those truths, Absolutely. rather than saying you know using our prism of you know 1920-22. Correct. No, and it's also good to have a character's POV Correct. because everyone will view a particular situation in a different manner. So Correct. essentially, bring Bharat's POV is wonderful. So you know, of course, we were talking about conspiracy, and if you break the word, it's cons and piracy. Uh, the gentleman sitting to my right was the first one who brought out a book on marine piracy and hijacking. So my question to you is that when you were writing uh, that very largely successful book, uh, how much of research did it entail, and did you choose to write it because you have such a you had such a distinguished career in the navy? Uh, yes, it's it's a very successful book. It's a very unique story. I don't think uh, anyone else has written about pirates in the Indian writing space. Uh, mainly because uh, people do not have access to information how this world works. But you all will be shocked to know that pirates exist in Indian waters. Like Choru Chakke land, 
वैसे चोर उचक के पानी में भी होते हैं सो दे गो एंड अटैक द शिप्स एंड द स्टील एंड द डू ऑल दैट दैट्स ऑल देयर इंडियन वाटर्स इज कंसिडर्ड बाय इंटरनेशनल मैरिटाइम ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एज पायरेसी इन्फेस्टेड वाटर्स व्हिच इज व्हाई व्हेन द मर्चेंट शिप्स आर ट्रांजिटिंग थ्रू दीज एरियाज दे विल हैव गार्ड्स इन प्लेस व्हिच इज व्हाई दैट केरला इंसिडेंट हैपेंड व्हेन द फिशिंग बोट्स साइड कमिंग क्लोज टू द शिप एंड दे थॉट दे पायरेट्स एंड दे शॉट देम डाउन नाउ हुज रॉन्ग हुज राइट ऑल दैट इज ऑल दैट इज डिबेटेबल अबाउट माय रिसर्च since i i had this privilege of working uh, as a uniformed officer i was uh, looking after the whole piracy anti piracy operations in indian waters sitting at delhi for 2 years as deputy director uh, around 15 years ago and i had information about this i also went to uh, japan i was deputed by government of india to do a maritime law enforcement course so i i knew about the technicalities i know what knew about the legality the legalities i had commanded a, a ship in goa so i knew about the operations and i thought this is such an exciting space about which the people do not know yeah. why not i write a fictional story around it and that's how it has happened many filmmakers have come and said after reading this is a great thing we are going to take this actor that actor and this is there's a hero and there's anti hero and all that nothing has happened beyond that point because someone has to write the screenplay i made friends with chatruji we had a drink also yesterday so i think uh, i i'm going to convince him to do the screenplay so there you go another conspiracy theory is started <laughs> wonderful no when you know uh, a very interesting thing that i have been thinking since a while is that whenever we speak about acts of freedom you know in 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 the especially with respect to armed acts of freedom or revolution uh the british invariably attach the word conspiracy to it you know be it the meerut conspiracy or the lahore conspiracy or lot of conspiracy cases when tribals were at war now as as we had discussed that we'll come to it eventually you've done a fabulous job of bringing out not only uh, you know the story of the legendary birsa munda but also other tribal warriors whose history uh, thus far has not been out at the forefront um you mentioned about birsa munda how was it and and you know he is one of the more prominent names within that uh, space so how easy or difficult was it for you to write about the other stories and how important do you think is it to change this narrative which has been set forth by the colonists because these were not conspiracies these were acts of freedom see the as far as the narrative is concerned it's already changing now i grew up in a place called jamshedpur now jamshedpur would have uh, a birsa chowk or a birsa nagar obviously you know uh, it would a birsa nagar would be more like a basti where some of the poorer people would stay so there was always this fascination with the term birsa munda but then because you know like somehow the colonial mindset or the convent education would imbue a certain you know a certain uh, you know inherent arrogance one wouldn't you know delve too much into the life of that character in fact there was very little information present but thankfully in the last 7 or 8 years in the system people have been talking about birsa munda mm-hmm. so as far as the narrative is concerned the narrative change had begun 7 8 years but i guess i think uh, for me the book was a journey inwards after writing right. everything i uh had to figure out something closer to me sorry i just need to come back to your question is specifically because one yeah. gets carried away and there no, is no, limited time it. so p- the question this was british is calling it conspiracy conspiracy and how e- difficult was it to write about you know the other so tribal each of the three books the first one birsa munda like i mentioned uh, uh, we followed this pattern where after taking into account all the information that was available we decided to fictionalize it where possible especially when it terms come came to the secondary, secondary character characters. the second of the series is a you know is an assembly or is an assembly of 17 different tribal warriors from across the country for this i realized that it's better to go in an essay format where you know in 2000 to 3000 words where basically we kind of encapsulate the entire Chroni- chronology of uh, what happened uh, you know during that era and it's very surprising that uh, while we consider 1857 largely to be the first war of independence tribal mutinies and revolutions have been active in india almost simultaneously across the countries from 1770s and more so in the early part of 1900 so but you know it was difficult to kind of uh, go exhaustively into each of the characters so we went into an essay format where we kind of assembled all the important information that was available and it's a short book yeah. where each uh, character has been given 2000 to 3000 words now one of the stories in that book 
is around a Santhal war which happened in 1855. And when we started delving more into it, we realized that that was a very important precursor to 1857. Right. So the third book is a novel around 1855. Again, I mean, we followed uh, to each his own approach. Absolutely. But that's how. No, it's, it's wonderful, you know, when you mentioned about the Birsa Chalk and how, you know, you saw something which inspired you. I think a personal example that I'd like to give was th would be that, you know, I'd gone for a literary festival in Assam and my publisher had taken us on a ferry ride and I saw this huge statue in the middle of the river. And, you know, I was very intrigued seeing it at night and, you know, the lights were on and I asked the people that who's this gentleman you know so so i got to know that it happens to be lachit barpukan and uh, i knew an assamese uh, author and i spoke to him i said that look this is a fantastic story it's a war happening on the waters and he you know defeated the mughals would you like to do a book on it and he said that yeah yeah i'd love to i am also descendant of the ahoms so so you know it was i said that yeah you must do it and Thankfully, you know, the book happened, it's also being turned into a visual adaptation and now, especially when the 400 uh, year anniversary celebration was held, uh, you know, a week or two ago in Delhi. So, I completely understand what you're saying. Um, to end it probably on a lighter note, uh, you know, we, we see a lot of these uh, political dramas in the OTT space and the web space where, you know, all the characters are always conspiring, they have ulterior motives, you know. So, as someone who is from the political field also now how realistic do you find that depiction you know a friend had once told me there is more politics in personal relationships and personal bonds than anywhere else mm -hmm. and I, I invariably find it true so I think between two friends in the same way that you sometimes manipulate information in between colleagues the same happens on a larger scale in the country so I think uh, you know if you try to be or if one tends to be holier than thou and take a view that politics is dirty. I think politics is everywhere. Is everywhere. That's, that's very well. No, uh, also the interesting thing is just, just as an aside, uh, we've been having kitchen politics in, on our television screens forever. Yeah. You know, forever. will, yeah. will, will so-and-so Bhabi find the spoon that is lying out there? That, that, that's a conspiracy theory that's been cooking. I mean, we've been doing that very effectively for the last. Balaji has, has minted money yeah. on that. So, they've, conspiracy theories have always been there. Conspiracy theories have always been there and I think, uh, one thing that's not a conspiracy is that we've got a very engaged audience and uh, we have time for a few audience questions. So if there's anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question, if someone could pass the mic, please uh, mention your name, your question and to who you wish to ask that question to. If it's for a specific person or if it's in general, please mention that and we'd like to take it. We'll, we'll try to keep our answers brief so that we can take uh, more questions. Please, Hello. please go ahead. Good morning. Yeah, uh, hi. I'm Harshil from Crossword. Hi. Hi. So the question anyone you all could answer. Uh, so there's also a conspiracy on medicine, for example. Like your human mind is mapped under the name of medical research. And you set the norms in terms of, you know, say your glucose, if it is this, you are a diabetic patient. But you invariably like, you know, play around with the norms and you try and lower it down or manipulate. Mm. So there is also something about medicine which is obviously a very big pharma as a company. Yes. And there's a lot of conspiracy and considering the kind of uh, the numbers in India what we have in crores. So yeah, something on that light if anyone would like to share. We're doing a book on something similar. It's called Pharma Sutra. But more on it once it once it releases. But yeah, Shatruji. So I think, you know, uh, Conspiracy theories in the corporate world are tremendous. There is just so much. Uh, because, you know, ultimately, it's the, the world is controlled by the corporates. Okay, everyone, every, everyone else, and that's, that's not a conspiracy theory. Okay, I genuinely believe that. That ultimately, uh, the world is con uh, controlled by corporates, whether it's the gun lobby, tobacco, pharma, doesn't matter, oil, it doesn't matter what. Okay, every decision is made in, on behalf of the corporates. Okay, uh, it's, uh, you know, oil is a great example. The kind of, you know, uh, 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 you know, obfuscation of truth that has happened in, in because of the oil industry. It's happening even today. I mean, climate denial is a huge reason. Uh, the reason uh, uh, is is the is the oil, is the oil industry. You know, so uh, the corporates are always there. You know, the, I, I I don't know if this is the truth, but I have heard this story said that, and I don't know whether it's Colgate Palmolive or whether it was Unilever. I don't know who. There was a theory apparently that somebody discovered. Okay, how do you get people to brush their teeth more? Right. So once they said you brush in the morning. Now that was great. 
Now, but how many times? Morning happens only once, so you can brush only once. They say, okay, maybe two times. Why night also you prefer going a brush? So now you have increased consumption by two. Now that has also become a pattern. Now you can't say every you can brush four times, five times. You can't do that. So the theory apparently, and this is a conspiracy theory. I don't know if it was true. The story goes that somebody came up with the idea. They said that when people squeeze uh, toothpaste, you know, they measure the length of the tooth. And usually everyone has a measured, they know that this, this much is what the length of that toothpaste is going to be on my brush. So you can't even manipulate that. So what they did was, they increased the size of the nozzle. Okay. They increased the, yeah, they, it's, I think it's uh, colgate Palmolive, but I don't know who. I'm not, and this is, uh, I hope nobody's from colgate Palmolive. I don't want to get sued for that. So maybe it was Unilever. So I don't know. Yeah, maybe, yeah, definitely them. So, uh, so what happens is they increase the now, what you do is you squeeze the same amount of toothpaste. You're looking at length, you're not measuring height. So, you know, th there are theories like that. So, so, in the corporate business, there are thousands of theories like this. And, uh, yeah, so pharma is obviously one. There is no doubt about it. And so, my take is, yeah, I mean, if we start digging in the corporate space, probably, as he said, Phar pharma sutra is there. Now, I don't know what else, all kinds of sutras we'll get. So, yeah, sure. Anybody else who has a question? Yeah, we have a lady in the front. Okay, I'll, I'll come, I'll come to Okay, you, you can you can go there. We'll come. We'll come back. Just, just give while us the mic comes to her. For the last twenty years, I've been telling my wife here, "Desi ki ke parate mat banao. Desi ki is supposed to be not good, making vegetable oil." And now all of us have realized that vegetable oil is actually toxic. So now I've started telling her, "Kewal desi ki me banao." That's the oil conspiracy he was talking about. <laughs> yes, sir. You being a writer, you uh, many time, umpty number of time, employ these conspiracy theories in your writing, right? But you cannot rule out the implication of conspiracy theory when it's come to society. So how do you look at it as a writer? Who do you want to ask this in particular? Uh, or in particularly general? Tohin sir and Kulpit sir. Because he also mentioned the thing that in, okay. uh, like the literature should be read, read uh, for the sake of entertainment only. But you cannot rule out the implication of that story, especially uh, conspiracy theories. So how do you look at it? Thank you. Both of you, if you could. Well, so, so, you know, the, uh, my writing is only an extension of what's happening in the society. So I don't see it. I don't delink it from and the implications. I think uh, rather the society, the what's happening in the society has its implications on my writing rather than the other way around. I don't take myself too, too seriously as a writer. There are too many writers, but I think it's the other way around. What happens in the society has its implications on my writing choices rather than my writing being able to influence it so much. I think what you are asking about is the dissemination of information to the public at large about what is truth and what is not true and how we can play a role in it. So uh, if, if this is what you are asking then my answer is this. As far as we are concerned, as far as I am concerned, I am a writer. And uh, I would like to do my jobs truthfully as far as non-fiction space is concerned so that at least I am doing my duty. And the other thing is not my mandate. That's I am not in that department. I am no, not the public officer in a private company or in public company to uh, you know make uh, dissemination of information. However, with this changing landscape and social media and media etc. All this is very turbulent times. Everything is in a chaos. And I completely see and agree because I also don't know sometimes whatever I'm reading is true or untrue and from where it is coming. But I think this churn is going to end at some point and things will stabilize. And then we will have fairer and more reliable sources of information. Nice. So in, fa in fact, you know, just to add to what you said that you what you see is what you write, you know, and uh, I was I was with him at another literary event a couple of weeks ago and there's an author of ours, Lieutenant Colonel Ankita Srivastav. And she was telling me, you know, that he had of course done a book uh, which was in this fiction space and she said that it was hard to believe, difficult to believe that how a man could capture the voice of a woman and what a woman goes through in a relationship. Be a ladies man for that. <laughs> 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 so exactly, so you know it's not just uh, the thriller aspect but you know also writers have the creativity angle so they can traverse genres is what I wanted to mention over here. Uh, yes, your the mic to the lady over here in the front. Hello. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, my name is Monica. I am hi, from Penmency. It's a small community of writers. Nice. Uh, so my question is to Kulpeet, sir. Uh, sir, my father was also in Indian Navy, and uh, he was in INS Trishul when uh, you know the pi they foiled the pirate attack uh, uh, that was going to happen in, in the Gulf. 
so I wanted to ask when if let's say I'm writing a story on that and if it is a non-fiction for fiction it's fine you can manipulate stuff if it's a non-fiction then how far would you go to uh, or are we allowed to breach confidentiality are we not allowed my father is also retired right now so what are the confidentiality norms in that kind of a situation because we're dealing with like country secrets yeah good question so uh, if you are writing a book which you want to make which you want to keep factually correct uh, you don't need anybody's permission but since your father is a retired officer if he's writing on that particular incident uh, you know the piracy a piracy attack that happened in gulf and indian navy uh, rescued people if he wants to specifically dedicate a book so uh, after writing the norms are very clear the book can be sent to the naval headquarters and they will review it and if there is nothing which 99.9% .9 cases they just going to review it and say ki please go ahead and then you can go ahead perfect so is there any other question that we have 11 11 so i think i think we are done with the time it's it's been a very invigorating session and you've all been a wonderful audience so i'd want all of you to have a huge round of applause for yourselves and of course for these three wonderful gentlemen who've made it all the more interesting Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Sohail, for the brilliant Thank you, questions. Thank I you. really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Being Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.